Great. So it's 635. I say we jump right in. Thank you guys so much for taking the time. My name is Nathan with the Montserrat Galleries. Before we get too much further, I'd like to introduce uh, the president of Montserrat College of Art, Kurt Steinberg. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for <clears throat> attending tonight. I want to really uh, thank uh, Emily for her uh, generosity uh, of uh, loaning us uh, what is a, just a monumental piece that is gracing the uh, one of our, our buildings right outside our administrative offices. I think 80 plus pieces uh, arranged. So thank you so much, Emily, for that. I know it, it brings great joy to anyone that is going to and from the space, even in our COVID moment. So thank you so much for that. Uh, and really want to uh, thank you for being here uh, today uh, to talk with us about your work. And I also want to just acknowledge and thank our partnership, uh, which continues to grow with uh, Richard Baiano and uh, Child's Gallery. So thank you so much, Richard, uh, for the work you do with us uh, in our community, but also uh, the generosity of allowing us to, to also have the piece here uh, via Emily. I just want to acknowledge just a couple of people real quick that I see. Uh, mm -hmm. Marsha Strauss, thank you so much for being here today. Stacy uh, and uh, Andrew Fish, thank you. Uh, great to see you here as well. Um, so we'll uh, hand it off and, uh, and, and, and get the ball rolling here. Nathan, thank you. Great, thank you so much, Kurt. Uh, again, I do want to express my, my deep thanks for the Child's Gallery. I know Catherine, I think I see on the call, who got a lot of emails from me, and especially Emily. I mean, this has just been really wonderful to get to know this artist really through the work, um, which I feel like happens so rarely in the social media age. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce Emily Lombardo, um, whose work weaves cultural and historical references to bring focus to marginalized narratives. Her practice often uses classical methods of printmaking to create timeless works of social critique. Emily is a 2020 AIM resident at the Bronx Museum in New York. She was a recipient of the Massachusetts Cultural Council Fellowship in 2016 and the SMFA Traveling Fellowship in 2017. Um, her work is also on permanent collections of the Academy Art Museum in Maryland, the Mead Museum, uh, Boston Public Library, Wheaton, and uh, MFA Boston. She has a BFA from MassArt, um, and of course in Boston here, and an MFA from SMFA, again in Boston, but currently is residing in New York, so hopefully we'll get her back soon. <laughs> that, I turn it right back over to Emily. Thank you so much. Wow. Um... Thank you guys so much. Hi, I'm Emily Lombardo. My pronouns are she, her, they, them. I should say right off the bat, I am coming to you from my apartment studio in the Bronx, where my daughter's bedroom is right behind us. And there's always all sorts of crazy sounds going on outside. So hopefully, I hope nothing will be too distracting for us. But if you hear anything like that, it's just the sounds of my everyday life. Um, I really want to echo what you all said when we opened up this session, you know, thank you so much to all of you at the gallery and at the Child's Gallery. It's really touching my heart to see so many people from Boston here. I miss you guys dearly. Um, and I know how much of an effort it was to get this work up, you know, during this time of COVID. I really appreciate that you took the time and the risk to, to make this happen so people can engage with the work during this time. Um, for better or for worse, these are topics that I feel like we're going to be talking about for a really long time in our lives. Um, and I want to, you know, just let you all know how grateful I am that you've taken the time to open up another screen, turn on another device um, to engage with me and this material today. Hopefully this will be fun and engaging for you guys. Feel free to put questions in the chat. I think we'll also do some questions at the end. Um, and I'm happy to uh, you know, dive as deep as you guys would like to go. All right. So I'm going to share my screen with you by the magic of Zoom. So we were talking about past, present, and future. So I'm just going to talk to you about my trajectory as an artist and as a human being, because for me, these two things are completely inseparable, right? Um, so 
I was born in New York, I have a very New York parents. And uh, when I was three years old, we moved to a rural town in Western Massachusetts, you know? So I've always had this like country mouse, city mouse vibe going on in my life. Um, and while I was there, just like so many like young kids trying to figure out what's going on, you know, kind of realizing I was different and understanding my queer identity. Um, you know, I got myself in a lot of trouble, some good things, some bad things. It was, it was a tough time out there, but the way I really kind of escaped and you know felt safe and got to know myself was by spending countless hours of time in my bedroom drawing and drawing and drawing and copying copying cartoons copying political cartoons copying you know anything i could find basically and i was kind of creating these like cool queer fantasies is what they, they kind of turned out to be um and as a result of this compiling and compiling of work, when I was 17, I had actually created a portfolio and I submitted it to MassArt. And I said, let's just see what happens. Um, I still had one year left in school. And to my surprise, MassArt liked the work and was willing to support me in do finishing my senior year in high school at the Massachusetts College of Art, both starting my college degree and finishing high school at the same time. So um, I love to slow, show this slide because in order to make this dream a reality and move to the city where I can go be a safe, happy queer kid, um, first I had to complete an entire year's worth of gym in the course of one semester um, of high school. And I was going to the school called Gateway and there wasn't much to do with us in the winter. So we had to do square dancing and we did square dancing from the fifth grade until graduation and for me, it was the most terrifying, uncomfortable thing in the entire universe. But in order to get myself out and over to that school, I square danced and Alamand left and dosy -si doed my way to Boston. So I always like to say I square danced my way to the city and I never quite looked back. All right, so. Um, when I find when I did get to mass art, I was like, I'm going to do something totally out of my comfort zone. And I'm talking about, you know, my art here, because I know there's a lot of art students looking at this work and just talking about my trajectory as an artist, because I've had, you know, moments where I've gone through a lot of change. Um, so I always want, you know, other artists to realize like these, these changes and these hard decisions happen. So like, when I went to mass art, I was like, I said, I'm going to do something totally different. I decided to study sculpture and I study glass of all things, one of the most difficult things to work with and completely outside of my comfort zone in the sense that now I had to almost always work with a partner. I almost had always had to work in a community with other people. So I went from being this like real loner to really being, you know, having to be in relationships with other people to be able to make the work happen. Right. And, you know, in terms of glass, I was always learning and perfecting this method of screen printing and getting enamel and imagery on glass that could be uh, manipulated by heat in the kiln, be it uh, flat glass, which is what you're kind of seeing on the right. So these images are screen printed and melted in the kiln. So you have layers and layers of paint and, and imagery or getting imagery on flat glass that can then be heated up and manipulated in the hot shop through a variety of different um, glass blowing processes. So I worked in this way for a really long time. Um, and, you know, 10 plus years working in glass, you know, really perfecting this, this one thing that I was obsessed with, which was like melting imagery in some way and controlling it in the heat. And I spent all this time with it. And, you know, you know, I taught, I taught at a glass school, I went to Pilchuck on multiple occasions, I assisted a lot of artists working outside of glass to realize their dreams in glass as well. And I had done so many things in glass and around, I think, 2010, after I've been working in glass for over 10 years, I decided to go back to school and get my MFA. And just at that time, it became really obvious to me that the medium wasn't really working for me as much as I was working for the medium, if that makes any sense. So I really wanted to delve into like these social critiques and be able to make work a little bit more on the fly. But because I was so reliant on having a shop or having, you know, these really aggressive tools like heat and tons of electricity, it was really holding me back from being able to do what I needed to do. And it's hard as an artist to make 
a change like that because you have built a community where you're like been doing this and now you're like, well, I'm going to do something totally different now. But I had to really boil down what who I was about, what I was about. And even in my first year of my MFA, I struggled and tried to keep making glass, but it just wasn't really working for me. So in reality, here I am kind of finding my happy place again, which is like the queer kid I described at the, in the first slide, like sitting down in a print shop with a book and a plate and just being able to draw, you know, that's, that's really my happy place. And there can be plenty of, there are lots of things and that you rely on when you're printmaking as well. But for me, like 90% of it is something I do in a very personal level, just on my own. Um, and what did I do? I decided to like tackle one of the most complicated and difficult printmaking projects that I could, you know, this Goya project gave me the ability to jump into like being able to examine so many issues of systemic abuse and societal abuse over a vast period of time. So um, what I did is I just jumped in and still, you know, trying to rely on what I already knew. When I first started the project, I made many of the first plates of the first images as screen prints. And everybody in my MFA, my advisory was like, you can't do Goya as screen prints. And I was like, oh, but I don't know how to do etching. Um, so this slide is here for you all to kind of, for those of you who don't know what etching is, um, this is a slide to kind of help you to understand it in a very, very basic term. So once I finally was like, fine, I'm going to learn etching so this work can be 100% about the conversation, the, con the content and not the technique. So um, short story about etching, what you're seeing here on this plate, um, well, this is not the plate, this is the print, um, is you see the line etching, right? So the lines are what you do first. So you get a copper plate, you put a black resist on it, it's like a hard wax, and then you use your fine needle and you scratch away and everywhere you've scratched away the black resist the copper is exposed put the copper in the acid the acid creates these ravines or incisions in the copper plate which later holds the ink and that's how you get the lines aqua tint is how you get the shading you know so once you have finished the line drawing the line etching um you go ahead and you put this this it's like a rosin it's like a fine dust you put on the on the surface of the plate um and you are putting that it's almost like you're turning like turning the surface of the plate into um sandpaper so it's like different levels of sandpaper the longer it's in there the more coarse it gets the more dark it becomes so that's how you get the lines and the and then the aqua tint is how you get the shading and just throw a little bit more insight to that. Here's a plate side by side. So on the right, you see the copper plate. And where you see this kind of like, you know, on this side area, you can see where the gray is, where it's like a little bit matte looking, right? So just to describe how I made the, like made each plate, all 80 of them, um, and all of them are six by nine, the same size as the Goya plates. Um, I would do all the drawings front facing. I didn't enter the project like doing it plate one to 80. I jumped into each plate as they kind of came to me. Um, and when I drew and designed the plate, I drew and designed them front facing, meaning it, they looked like the plate would look when it was printed. Then I would take that drawing, put that in the computer, flip it, print that out, take my copper plate, which had the hard ground on it, a trans piece of transfer paper, my drawing on top, and then I would draw it again. So now I'm drawing it for the second time to transfer it onto the plate, take that off. And then I would, with my etching needle, draw the image into the copper plate that would then be put in the acid. So in order to make each plate, I basically drew everything three times, just to kind of put that into some, some context for those of you that don't do etching. Um, and here I am. And just to show you a little bit more, that is not me. That is my printer, Opal DeRuvo, printing, printing at the Center for Contemporary Printmaking in Norwalk, Connecticut. Um, Opal and I have had a really fantastic relationship. They were working at a coffee shop across the street from a bar that I was working on when I was getting my, when I was just starting to do this project as my thesis. And I was like, and they were like, I'm really good at printmaking. And I'm like, I'm pretty good at making plates and stuff. And they have supported me and have been the printer for the published edition since we started this. So 
we work really well together and I just wanted to show you this slide to give you the full the full technique, which is once the plate is made, Opal has um, rubbed very vigorously rubbed ink into the surface of the plate. So it's in there. It's lined up. The paper is already engaged in that roll. So you can see there's some paper there. Um, and then that goes through the press with a pretty severe amount of pressure. I don't know the number of the pressure, but it's a lot of pressure. So much so, so that when you take the plate out, you take the paper off, it sticks a little bit and you see the entire plate impression. Um, I love the line quality of etchings. This is just like, you see the paper has been forced into these grooves and you can just get the most beautiful and amazing and delicate details with etching. Um, and this piece that he's pulling, that they are pulling up is, a new etching project that I'm working on. So this is not one of the Capricios, but they, they are printing my new plates as well. All right, so here I was being like, I'm gonna do 80 plates and, you know, just to like put this into some context between me and the man himself, Mr. Goya. Um, you know, this was, Goya was making his plates in, you know, in Spain, Madrid in 1799. Um, this project took him three years to complete and it was his first etching project. Same, 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 except for I made my plates between Boston and New York between 2013 and 2016. It also took me three years to complete, complete, and it was my first etching endeavor as well. And I've always been drawn to the to Goya's this particular body of Goya's work because he really wanted to speak to the people of Spain about what was going on, and he knew firsthand because he was in it. He was part of it, you know. And we know Goya in the context of being a painter up until this point, up until he makes Los Capricios, right? So when we look at this first plate, which you know, he is presenting himself as Goya, the painter, right? And we know him as that, you know, he's been painting the nobility, all the people that he's implicating in these plates and these darknesses are actually the people that are paying all of his bills. So he has a very complicated, complicated relationship to what is going on. And he has a lot at risk by making this project. Um, you know, and I, you know, this plate and the Sleep of Reason is a place where both Goya and I are you know, positioning our identities, you know, so you can understand the point of view of, of the narrator, or the author here. So I am really trying to show my differences from Goya, right? I've positioned myself, I'm not the painter, I'm the printer. The printer tends to be more of a working class person, right? So printing is associated with some working class thing. I've tried to dress myself in more of a working class look. I have a smaller hat. I'm wearing like a tank top and I have kind of like a cheap scarf around my neck. So I'm very much saying like, I'm looking at this, I'm looking at America, you know, not Spain during this time um, through a queer feminist lens. And this is the lens that we're looking at all 80 of these plates. So I always show these two plates first, you know, because the, you know, again, they both are positioning the identity of the authors. Um, and there's a lot of, you know, there's a Goy is always up to something with his capriccios because he's trying to like satisfy so many different things and kind of do a little bit of trickery and fly under the radar, right? So there is a moment, there's some speculation that the sleep of reason was going to be the first plate at one stage and then he kind of positions it in the middle, you know, instead. And by doing that, what he what he does is he really creates two movements in the Capriccio. So out of these 80 plates, um, you know, after the sleep of reason, things start to get really dark and nightmarish. It's like the, you know, everything becomes a little bit more grotesque. The plates before that equally disturbing, but you can kind of, you know, you see recognizable people, things like that. Um, but then once he kind of falls into the sleep, we see a lot of witches, goblins, things like that, things of that nature. Um, I always say that I didn't have the luxury of using fantasy in my, my work because almost everything in every plate was pulled from a headline, from the news, from a, something I saw on TV, almost everything that I'm referencing happened, although I use a lot of composite images. So take things across a vast period of time and put them in one plate. Um, they are all things that 
were in some way real or presented to me as real. You know, I, they may not have been real. Um, you know, so he is, you know, falling asleep with, as this artist, who has this big weight over him of these owls and bats and his got this sphinx back there looking at him. And, you know, I've got my my dog at the time who was just like, would constantly just stare at me through better, for better, for worse, no matter what was going on. And I'm falling asleep too. And I, what I've done here is I've dressed myself in like, what seems like a dress and like more feminine boots, like a dress that I probably would not typically wear, but I'm really trying again to position myself as a woman in this plate as well. Um, because instead of using, like, instead of having owls, the owls and the bats and things, for me, I'm using these elephants, which are very specific references of uh, Walt Disney's elephants from Dumbo and this incredibly, like, heart-wrenching scene where Dumbo is, like, pulled away from his mother in the cartoon. And, you know, I'm thinking, as I'm falling into my sleep, I'm thinking about this, and this was before I, I had a daughter, you know, what it would mean to have a child in this day and age where either everything's burning or everything's flooding or you know children are being poisoned and like there's abuse happening across every, all these sources everywhere you look and like if it's hard for me to exist you know what does it mean to, to bring children into this world and as a woman who could do that what are the implications and, and all the things that that kind of swarmed around me in that way so for me you know these are some of the things that were haunting me as i was falling into my sleep of reason. Um, on the table, you see like teapots and you'll see in a lot of other plates, I have like teapots and little tea, little tea cups um, because the tea party was like a thing that was like kind of up front when I first started this project. So I'm kind of making reference to the conservative party. So I usually don't start with plate number two, <laughs> but um, it's one of the first plates that I did. And I don't know if anybody out there is willing to admit or does actually watch The Bachelor, but you know, The Bachelor is a program that's been on for almost 20 years. And actually the show is completely blowing up right now because everyone's realizing how problematic and screwed up it's been all this time. And a lot of, there's a lot of things happening. So I decided to, in terms of the show. So I decided to start with this, um, this plate. Uh, you know, I started watching The Bachelor when it first came out because I here I was as a queer woman being told like they're like gay people should not have be able to be married like this would be wrong what would you be doing to the institution of marriage but meanwhile you know people heteronormative people are going on tv and basically having this performative game of marriage you know so i'm saying to myself wait like you're telling me my love is not worthy of marriage but yet it can be a basically a reality TV joke on, on one hand, but it's legal for them because they're straight, right? So in my plate, um, this is actually a bachelorette who's featured in the, in the front here, and her name was Emily Maynard, so I felt particular connection to her. Um, right behind her is Hugh Hefner, basically the king of heteronormativity, and you have the Pope, you know, is always being condoned, you know, heteronormativity is always being condoned by the church. And then you have um, Chris Harrison in the background to the potentially defunct host of The Bachelor, cheersing her on as she holds onto her rose and thinks about who she's going to pick. And she has a crowd is roaring for her. And then, you know, just yeah, like I use celebrity in the same way that Goya was using the nobility you know, in the monarchy, you know, so he's in a lot of these plates, especially in the first 40, you're seeing a lot of imagery of, you know, people like I think in Goya's plate, I think that's the Duchess of Alba. It looks a lot like her based on the paintings. I'm not an art historian. And also there, like Goya never wrote any specifics about what these plates were, just a couple, there's a couple of very vague sentences that fly around with each plate, but there, we, we don't know from Goya's mouth what he was thinking in any of these plates. And he doesn't make them easy to understand. Um, but what is interesting about it is he, in, the, in his social critique, he implicates himself in, in a lot of these darknesses, right? Like he shows that he himself is not perfect, you know? So 
one thing that is highly problematic about him in a lot of his plates is that he's often pos positioning women as using trickery on men to get money or status like goya's got a complicated relationship with women and i realized even in retrospect <laughs> looking at some of the plays that i have and maybe continue to have a complicated relationship with women but um in my plate i'm positioned um Kardashians, the Kardashian, Chris, Chris Jenner, and um, I'm blanking on her first name now, but you know who I mean, the top Kardashian, and she is pregnant, and this is I, and in the background, we have the paparazzi, you know, so the paparazzi is kind of held at bay, and when I say I was like, I feel like I was being kind of tough on them in this, or maybe a little bit mocking on this, because, you know, you say what you will, I don't, follow their brand. I'm not into the things that they're into, but they are really strong women who have created this multi-million dollar empire, you know, so here I am judging, judging, judging as many people in our society. We just watch and watch and watch these celebrities and we judge them from afar and we have all these opinions on what they're doing right, what they're doing wrong, no matter how hard they're just wor working to get by. So we, we kind of lose empathy with people, you know, and that would kind of gets us to a place where we would let, or we would watch as a society, like a beautiful young woman and singer like Amy Winehouse, who's basically kill herself over the course of several months or years in front of a camera. And I'm not saying that anybody specifically could have stopped her, but maybe there would be a moment where people would have turned off the cameras and we would have stopped watching, but we watched that all the way to the end. Um, in terms of, Things about this plate, which is particularly interesting and unique. Um, out of the 80 plates, only two of them are just aquatint, meaning there's no line etching. And this is one of them. So in Goya's and in mine, this is all aquatint, which is a kind of complicated way of making the plate. It's like a reductive printmaking process where I would kind of start by blocking the paper white, put it in the acid for a little while, get a second tone lock that, put it in the acid, get a third tone. So it's a really kind of backwards way of, of creating an image. Um, so just this plate and one other plate that maybe you guys can find on the wall is made only with the aquatint. So I also am, you know, went to this stage where I was like talking about the opulence of the art world, you know, and how you know, there is such an amazing amount of wealth and and things like that floating around in these upper echelons of the art world, right? So in Goya's plate, they've already got a seat. You have these figures that are kind of behind these maybe privileged kids and they're kind of mocking them and the kids are like so privileged that they could wear their chairs on their head, right? Um, and this is a good plate to look at in comparison to mine because this is one where I broke this rule that I had for myself where I was trying to make the compositions like very exactly like Goya's at a certain stage when I was doing the project it was just way too restrictive I was like I can't make every plate have the exact same amount of people in the exact same places you know so I can always like I'm one of these artists that's always making rules and I had to be like pump the brakes on that rule um so you can try to get across the point that you want to make right so in my plate I'm bringing in this kind of, you know, wealth and consumption of the art world. And what I'm doing here is I've positioned Maria Abramovich across from James Franco from her work, The Artist is Present at MoMA. Um, and here they are. And I, don't get me wrong, I think this work of art is beautiful. And I think Maria Abramovich is an amazing artist. Um, but I'm really thinking about that in the context of the people that don't go to MoMA, the people who could never have the time to go in the MoMA, who didn't have the time to sit in a chair and stare into someone's eyes for 20 minutes, five minutes, an hour. Um, so but right behind Maria and James Franco are day workers, day laborers who are just like trying to get a quick bite to eat. And as you can see, if you're lo looking in the background, there's a little bit of a veil in between the, you know, artists of prominence and the people on the outside of the museum. 
Again, I'm going to say like James Franco does appear, appear in at least four of the plates. I don't know. <laughs> There's a lot of reasons why. Um, but this is an example of a plate where I've also changed the, um, the, the text. So most of the plates, I'm doing a direct translation of Goya's text. Um, but for this one, it made sense to obviously not use what a diamond beak because he has this parrot with a diamond beak, but I have replaced that with what a diamond skull. Um, then obviously we are worshiping or bored by Damien Hirst's diamond skull that is kind of maybe, you know, oratoring at us on its, like it's on a, um, an auction, it's on an auction podium, you know, so it's up there, you know, telling us some stuff. And, you know, I'm in my MFA at this time, so, you know, I'm like learning all about the inner workings of the art world and, you know, in some ways, obviously I'm repulsed by the diamond skull for what it represents, but in many ways I would also dream of reaching a place where I would have that much notoriety and fame, you know, so it's like a real like push and pull and across from me is James Franco because while I was making this project um, and getting my MFA, he was going through this stage that he was getting an MFA from Columbia and he was getting an MFA from an art school in on the West Coast and it was just blowing up all over the place on the art world. And I was like, are you kidding me, James Franco? Everywhere I turn, there you are. And kind of like this idea of like, you know, I am working so hard, you know, I've always had to have a day job or some type of income. I'm working so hard to get this one MFA and he is just gobbling up MFAs all over the place. So, you know, here we are, this crowd of potentially academics, art students, regular everyday people who could be either worshiping or honestly just falling asleep at whatever this diamond skull is preaching to us. Okay, so um, it's a, ba a bad night, plate 36. I really wanted to show this plate because it speaks to the tension between the text and the image. There's a lot of tension between the text and the image in all of my plates and all of Goya's plates because he was always trying to make it very hard to understand. Um, my plate shows on the left, you have Rodney King. In the right, you have Trayvon Martin. And then you're looking at this title and you're like, a bad night. Like, first of all, these two people lived in two different periods. Of, these were two different people in two different periods of time. They never saw each other. And it makes you think it's a, like, it's like a little off-putting. It's like, bad night? Like, it makes you really think like, how many times have we seen this? So what does this mean, a bad night? You know, what it really means is that every night is a bad night, potentially to be Black in America. You know, so the idea is to really think about this. There could be a whole many, many, many more people in this plate. But the idea is to really get, the text makes you think. And that's how I entered my discovery of all these texts with Goya. It was like looking and looking at the images and looking at the text and being like, what are you trying to say? And then eventually coming up with that translation and that that trickery to, to make the viewer think along those lines. And sometimes like kind of be annoying, be like, what? Like, why would that be the title? But then like, you're like, okay, I think this is a learning moment. Um, <clears throat> you know, obviously there are so many things that go on in these 80 plates, but you know, one of the most important is the issues of white supremacy that, you know, is all around us in American culture. So, you know, the last plate we just looked at was plate 36. This is in the seventies. Um, so now, you know, we've gone to sleep, you know, things are getting dark, right? We're past the sleep of reason. Um, but I'm using recognizable figures here. So the person on the shoulders is Dylan Roof, who is the shooter of the, at the uh, Methodist Episcopal Church in Charleston, South Carolina, riding on the shoulders of Darren Wilson, who was the police officer who shot Michael Brown in Ferguson. Um, and it was really important to me to show, you know, take the mask off one of the um, KKK members to reveal that there's a woman under the mask. And this idea that these are familiar, familiar, like passing down of supremacy and racism from generation to generation. This happens throughout families. Um, and also just in general doctrination with different signs and symbols so you have your confederate you have the confederate flag you have um the very 
Nazi Germany eagle, and below that you have two of the victims from the shooting. Um, so this is again another example of where we're taking a lot of things from history to create a composite narrative. Affiliation. Um, this one is, you know, on the on the left side, we're seeing another one of Goya's plates where he's like suggesting like this woman might be engaging in some type of a trickery to like be married to someone. So they're like questioning her identity or like her lineage or where she's from. Like, so this was a plate, one of the later plates that I did. Um, and this was in reaction to Governor Pat McCrory's bathroom bill um, from North Carolina. And this was the bill that suggested that people could only enter bathrooms based on their gender identity from their birth certificate, which is like, how do you police something like that in the bathroom anyway? It was just um, a very difficult and cruel bill to try to have passed. So here you see him on the left and he's like kind of trying to check you know, this woman's identity as she's kind of holding these two kids for kind of protection, right? And you have the, the female and male bathroom behind that. And this is imp incredibly important to think about now as well, and still very, re well, can, very relevant was then, was now, as, you know, so many anti-trans anti youth bills are popping up all over the country right now. Things to ban trans kids from sports, things to ban trans kids from being able to access medical care that they need. There, are, It's happening everywhere and we don't hear about it because it's happening in a state that's not near us. You know, it's happening in Alabama, it's happening here, but these kids are dealing with the repercussions. So, uh, Sadly, this plate is very, very relevant today. I encourage you to look up what is going on in some of these other, other states. Um, I think it's interesting to note, like in Goya's, there's that like little thing sticking up. It's like a signet. It's supposed to be like an all seeing eye. It's kind of like a witchcrafty kind of thing. Um, and on mine, I've replaced that with like these two surveillance cameras. And something you'll see in a lot of the plates um, as you're at Montserrat and looking at them um, is there surveillance in a lot of the plates. Like you're, you are being watched either by actual surveillance cameras people's cell phones, iPads, flying cameras, cameras and surveillance are a major character in my capricious. This one, um, <clears throat> yeah, this is also one of the later, later plates that I made. And this was in reaction to the shooting at the Pulse nightclub, which really hit home for me as someone who were, has spent many, many years working at gay nightclubs and could imagine the terror of being trapped in a nightclub, which is actually very hard to get out of because they're always trying to make sure they know who's getting in. Um, so when this happened, I mean, it was a complete terror and I had not, you know, come up with anything for this plate and it just really came pretty quickly for me. Um, and what's happening here and they spin finally it's this, this thing you see this in a lot of boys work is like there's like a passing of things like sometimes people are holding hands or like things are passing so in this case um the pulse nightclub shooter is handing off money to a gun seller meanwhile the president of the nra wing lapierre is in the background counting and counting his money right so it's yet another example of a mass shooting where the NRA somehow manages to come out, convince people to buy more guns and puts profit over human lives. So we're getting a little close to the end here, um, just of the plates that we're gonna discuss tonight. And, you know, it's so important to note that I finished this series in 2016, maybe a month before the election, um, <laughs> when I could still have some humor about some of these things. And, uh, you know, this plate is showing Trump kind of wrestling, wrestling with Hillary Clinton. Like, I couldn't believe, like, how dirty this election seemed and how people were clawing at each other. And, like, Bernie Sanders is underneath kind of, like, volleying at them, but not really connecting. And, the American Eagle is swooping in and I'm like thinking, wow, I can't wait for the election to be over and for all of this to be behind us. 
And I guess that is absolutely not what happened, right? So um, I this is the last plate, which I did a very close relationship to the one that we just looked at. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, in terms of like doing the plates in order, this is I had to do the last plate as the last plate for myself. And um, when you're looking at, you know, Goya's final plate and the trajectory of his whole series and my series, this it, it is time. It's like the sun has come up. The goblins have been revealed. We can see them in the light of day. Um, now, you know, he makes some reference to like, wouldn't it be funny if we paraded them around the streets? Like we we can maybe take control of them, right? Like that's kind of how I interpreted Goya's, Goya's plate. So for me, I just really illustrated the systems of supremacy in this country, right? And like I positioned them as empty vessels. So if you're looking at them, you know, their eyes are blacked out and this idea that, you know, it's up to us every generation whether or not we're going to let these characters be reanimated. You know, they don't have to be reanimated. We can see them for who they are. We can see the abuse of power in the church. We can see the dangers of racism on so many levels. And we can see, you know, you have the Wall Street guy on the left who's like, doesn't care about anything but money, you know, just like sitting on his pile of money, doing drugs, doesn't care about anybody suffering around him. So this idea of like, we can see this, we can see Wall Street, we can see all these things. Like, do we want to keep reanimating this all the time, you know? And again, sadly, as we were going into the election, I am a very, um, very optimistic person. So, you know, I hope that with this, with time, we will reanimate these characters less and less and less. Um, I believe that as a society, we try to be better people, you know, and like we have to find little, little chunks of, of hope. And the fact that I'm here having this conversation with you as a very out and openly gay, gender nonconforming artist. Um, and you seem to be interested in my point of view and the work is in this these museum collections to be compared with and studied with Goya's work and other work for years to come for me that is a sign of progress i see a lot of signs of progress out there in our society um i was going to give you a quick just like little pop of like where i am and what i'm doing now if we pulled the zoom camera away where you would see like this is my studio on the left so like you can imagine where i'm sitting is where that painting is on the wall um and we're just kind of like wanted to talk a little like i talked about my trajectory with my work and having to make decisions where i was kind of in in the driver's seat and was able to make work on my own terms um and you know right before COVID, we moved into a much bigger apartment and i moved my i have an entire room with my studio in it and prior to becoming a mother, I had to make new decisions about how I was going to be, how I was going to be able to make work. Um, so my work is a lot more focused on painting and drawing now. Um, and I've had to come up with strategies for how to create little bite sized project, like little bite sized pieces of work every night from the window of like seven to 11 o'clock while my daughter is asleep or I'm not at work. Um, and then if I keep making and making these bites, eventually a lot of work is finished. So I do encourage you to go on my website. I have a ton of new work on there, which we just don't have time to talk about now. Um, on the right side of this, of, of this picture here, I wanted to show you that I had started collecting everything I needed to have my own like acid tank in the studio. So we, I have this, um, this little oven for heating up my hard ground. And then I found this um, kind of perfectly sized uh, motorcycle oil pan that I cut the top off of and put all my acid inside so I can do all of my um, etching right here in my apartment. So again, like these are strategies that I've kind of developed over the years to be able to do the work that I need to do when I need to do it in my own space, which has been helpful that I've already created those strategies as this past year and everything with COVID has happened. So um, yeah, this is it. I mean, you know, how I've managed to get by in this difficult year was like spending time with my wife, Anna, and my daughter, Lucia, and uh, just trying to stay as 
healthy and calm and kind of connected to what's going on um, over the past year and really just starting to reflect now. Um, but there's my website, emilylombardo.com. Uh, please follow me on Instagram at Emily the Lombardo. And if you have any questions or anything, just always feel free to email me at emilylombardo at gmail.com. Now I will stop screen sharing now. Please tell me about you. I've said so much about myself. <laughs> Yes, thank you so much, Emily. That was just above and beyond. We really appreciate it. And we've got, you know, about 10, 15 minutes for some questions. So please feel free to um, take yourself off mute or if you want to put them in chat, I'm happy to relay them for you. That was awesome. I just what, was wondering if that presentation is shareable. Yeah, it could be. Yeah, absolutely. That, that was just fabulous. Oh, cool. Um, yeah, that. I've already shared the slides with with uh, Nathan, so I'm happy to share it forward as needed. And we will also be uh, kind of editing up tonight and packaging it so it'll be available on YouTube as well. So. Okay. Yeah, if you could edit out all of my hand gestures. I'm a very Italian talker. <laughs> it's like it's like there's flies, yeah, yeah. there flies all over this room. <laughs> well, that was that was fabulous. I... Thanks. I mean, there are so many places to choose from. I feel like every time I do a talk, I I try to pick like a little bit of a different vein, you know. But like I I did really start the the series with this entry point of celebrity and reality TV shows because I was on a very heavy diet of reality TV shows at that time. Um, and then obviously it unfolded into so much more. I actually have a great print question from one of Montrose professors, uh, Stacy Thomas Vickery, who asks, uh, do you hand apply your rosin or is it spray paint? It looks like it's hand applied. Ah, <laughs> um, it's so interesting. So you, you can see that I learned my etching mainly from Peter Scott at the museum school. And at the museum school, we used an airbrush rosin technique. So I'd say at least two thirds of the plate are made with airbrush technique. And I actually have an airbrush here so I can do aquatint in my apartment as well. Um, and then when I moved to New York, I didn't, at that time, I didn't have all this jazz set up. So I was like, Ugh, what am I going to do? I have to learn how to use rosin again. It had been so long. I had used rosin when I was at Mass Art back in the early 2000s. I, hadn't, I really didn't remember it. Um, but I went to Robert Blackburn's studio where they have the ye old uh, rosin box that you like crank it up and get the dust going and then the dust falls beautifully on the plate like 50 percent of the time it works well or you have to wipe it off and start again so yeah to answer your question most of the plates over half were with spray paint but some of them are with rosin so i have a question i'd like to ask emily oh hi richard hi emily how are you that was wonderful oh thanks so uh it's interesting because four years ago when you were creating all of these images, I remember us discussing how wonderfully topical they were at the time. And I remember thinking specifically with the election that, as you said, it would all be over soon. And that wasn't what happened. And what's interesting to me in hindsight is the plates seem almost more relevant now than then and just as topical. And so my question to you would be, if you had another four plates of the Capriccios to do, what current um, events would you choose to depict? Well, definitely the um, the events of January sixth have got to be in there. Like that's yeah. that's a, that's no, that has to happen. Um, George Floyd, sadly, I would have to be in there. Um, probably a couple of others, but those are like the two that are definitely popping to mind and. You know, definitely some things that have to do with COVID and just this experience of, you know, living where I do in the Bronx and going through this period of time where all that I heard every 10 minutes was another set of sirens going off, you know, so something, something to deal with with COVID as well, definitely. Um, 
And I do, you know, I get a lot of often asked if I would do a series of the disasters of war. And I've keep, been keeping that in my mind. And it's very different than, you know, from, for me and for Goya, they're very different works. You know, the yeah. disasters of war is very dark. And I do see that as something that I might do at some stage. And I think that's when issues of like the opioid crisis, um, Me Too, and, um, you know, what's happening with COVID, things like that will definitely potentially be in in that series if I decide I want to go down that dark dive. <laughs> well, let me know if you do. <laughs> yeah, I will say that I'm trying to like my work that I've been doing since has been, you know, kind of celebrating queer histories and queer narratives. So I've taken a little bit of the darkness away, but- uh, I think that's probably motherhood. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, I like to have a little balance. Yeah. Well, thank you again. Yeah, sure. Thank you. You know, kind of bouncing off that question too, I love how you talked about your your works like reanimating um, these characters, these fictions, these histories. Um, and then bouncing off that too, as this is both a, um, well, yeah, a document and a fiction. And it kind of becomes this this social narrative of, of the world. And I wonder how you think about these things kind of continuing living on as a particular time and place. Um, and I don't know, and that maybe it's just the same question. like what does this work look like in 2024? Or um, as like the years kind of, we, we have that little bit of distance from the events. Yeah, I mean, there's a, co a couple of things with that. And that is like, when we look at Goya's work, we have no idea who those people, what, who is he talking about? But if you were, we were the people living in Spain during that time, and we know that based on the ones that were collected and then colored by people who bought them, that they had ideas about who they were. And they were, these individual figures were very relevant to them. But ultimately these figures just are stand-ins for you know much of larger and greater narratives. So at some stage, you don't need to know that that is Emily Maynard from The Bachelor, but you're like, what? Why are these like? Why are all these people cheering while she's like, you're like, what is happening in this scenario? You know, like. So I think that's the beauty of the Goya work and the whole project now and and in the past is that you don't need to know who the people are and like, just like Goya, I don't, don't write explicit um, definitions of each plate. Like if people have come to my artist talks, they're gonna learn what's going on in each plate, but it's not like when you go to a museum, you see a full text that says, you know, that is Dylan Roof. Like that doesn't happen in my museum text because I want, people don't need to figure out exactly who it is. But if you're talking to me, chances are I'm gonna tell you, um, but ultimately they don't need to be specific. Thank you. Yeah. So yeah, we'll become further and further removed, but we'll, same as with Goya's, where you're like, what, what is happening here? This makes it more mysterious. Well, if I'm not seeing other questions, Emily, we just want to thank you so much and for the time. And uh, like I said to everyone, this is going to be up on YouTube here in just a matter of days. Um, your exhibition is going to be up on campus pretty much through uh, May 15th. So mm -hmm. there is something I can send out to you about how to view it. Um, there is obviously a visitor tracking form that anyone need to complete before coming on campus. But Kurt, did you raise your hand or? Yeah, just real quick. I just wanted to say uh, again, a big thank you to Emily. Um, I think the, the work, as you can tell, is just right on topic, fortunately and unfortunately. Right. Um, and um, it just has spurred on really good conversation on campus amongst people one-on-one -on -one and in groups. So thank you so much for facilitating that for us as we do this. And um, just thank you for your generosity and just what a great uh, presentation tonight. It was really amazing. Thank you so and much. Emily. Thank you all for listening and engaging with the work every day on campus and with me tonight. And if you would want to see all of the plates, they are on my website. You know, you can see all 80 of the plates there as well if you can't, can't make it to the campus. And Karen can look at them herself at the Boston Public Library because she has her own copy. <laughs> Hi, Karen. Anyway, thank you guys. Hi, Emily. It's Hi, a great, great talk. And I, this series just is wonderful. I, I'm so glad we have it in the collection. Me too. I'm, I'm so ecstatic that it's there. Great. Well, thank you all. Have a wonderful night.
everybody have a great night. Thank you.